Thank you for giving us an opportunity to be with you today. I'm here in Vancouver, Washington. My, my interview guest is a gentleman by the name of David Mador. You'll probably hear a little bit more about David as we go forward, but uh, I'm very interested and very excited about this. Uh, uh, he, has, he has many assets that he's going to be talking about before, but, uh, but the bottom line is that this is going to be great, and let's just get him on right now. David, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Oh, fantastic. Glad to, glad to be talking with you. Oh, good, David. Well, you know, David, you know, I tell you, I've heard a lot about David Mador. And I guess a number of folks have heard about David Medor, but I want the public to know who David Medor is. And uh, so what, that's, I think that's the way we want to go with this situation. You've got many facets of your background and whatever that I'm very, naturally, I'm, my, my purpose initially was the, the CRC, Columbia River crossing aspect mm -hmm. of it. It's major here with, within the Pacific Northwest. It is. Here in between Portland and Vancouver, I've done a number of issues on, on CRC from the Portland aspect of it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but the bottom line is it, it's, it's a major piece. It affects the, the state of Oregon and Washington in a big, big way. Mm -hmm. And I know very much that you've been very much involved in this whole process aspect of it. But before we go there, let's talk about David for a moment. Okay. Okay, okay fine. Right away. David, okay, fine. Pacific Northwest, how'd you get back, get down this one? Uh, we were actually, I was raised in Michigan. Okay. Grew up there through 10th grade in high school. Finally, I'm one of eight kids. Okay. So you learn how to get along oh, right. in a okay, big David. family. Lived like right next door to nine cousins. When I was, uh, when we finished up the 10th grade in high school, we ended up moving to California, all of us out of state for the first time. Mm -hmm. We settled there. I went uh, through the Navy. It was nuclear power. I went through their nuclear power training. Served on board a fast attack nuclear submarine as an electrician, and from from there ended up uh, coming back home, getting married. Been married for 35 years now to my wife Donna. We have three wonderful adult grand or children now. Three daughters. Two of them are married. I'm a, I'm a grandfather, and I've been an, invent an inventor. All my life, since really? I saw my first spark about five years old, I just love electronics, love engineering, huh. love problem solving, product development, and I've had just the opportunity to, to pursue that career as a problem solver. I'm a problem solver to problem the core. Solver. I, I like love that. problems. Oh, that's good. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> people think, oh, a problem, it's a, it's yeah. a burden. I think, no, a problem. It's like a doggy with a bone. Oh, boy. I like to be able to, okay. to, uh, to solve those problems. So back in 1990, uh, actually 1980, 79 really, um, and I ended up starting a business out of our home, a little mm -hmm. business called U.S. Digital, with a big name, US thinking someday Digital. it will grow. And that was in our home uh, uh, through 1990 in California. And we were surrounded by all of our friends and family there. We were, that was our new home. Moms and dads, brothers and sisters, and cousins, and both sides of the family, a lot in-laws and all. And we had just assumed that we would continue to stay there for years and years. And we have one brother, my next younger brother, Chris, ended up moving to, actually going up the five freeway. And in that vacation in the summer, uh, noticed the Northwest. Okay. They went all the way up to Canada wow. and explored on the way back. And by yeah. the time they got back home, they said, we're moving to the Northwest. We're moving to <laughs> Medford, Oregon. <laughs> and for the first time, it caused us to evaluate where are we, why are we living where we are? Mm -hmm. Is this the best place to live, raise your family, run your business, live mm -hmm. your life? Mm -hmm. And that set me off because I'm kind of an analytical researcher as well uh, to find out the answer to those questions. Where ought we really to live? And after a year's worth of research, places rated, national climatic data, and a whole bunch of big long list of, of researching and, and making several scouting trips, mm -hmm. the obvious choice for our family for quality of life was Clark County, Washington. And it is, this is a very unique location here, very unique. Great, wonderful advantage that we have here over so many places in America. So we chose to move here and the rest of my family said, wherever you're going, we're going too. I said, I could be making a mistake. You guys get to do your own homework. And they ended up following here. So Ready? we have nobody left in California. Wow. Moms and dads and brothers and sisters All and here. cousins and a whole bunch of people are here. This is our new home. Well, that's unique. And, we, and that was in 1990 we made the move. During that time, our business has continued to grow and now it's occupying uh, 115, 117,000 square foot building and we employ 130 some people now and it's also grown we have some extra space in the building that we bought and mm -hmm. paid for it's mm -hmm. every i'm a cash uh, debt-free guy born poor and learn to the work ethic and to be a good diligent uh steward of your funds make wise decisions focus on making other people successful and everybody wins when you do that 
And so the, the extra space we had in our building here, uh, about 17,000 square feet, and then we expanded that to 25,000 square feet, ends up being what we call the U.S. Digital Outreach Center, where it houses uh, 30 some nonprofit organizations that really? serve our community here. And it's been just a, a great experience for us to be able to really engage with the community. Now, I never was really involved in the political arena uh, much. And as you can imagine, raising your own family mm -hmm. and having investing in the relationships, life's all about relationships. Right, exactly. And running your own business, especially mm -hmm. anybody who's run their own business, they know how all consuming that can be, especially when you first start it. Uh, that has been where our focus has been. And as a result, we really haven't engaged very much in the community until in recent years. And one of those things that got me involved was one of the biggest changes, really the, the largest project in the history of our area. I, I uh, got wind of, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And I started asking some questions, and that ended up... How long was that ago about? Uh, we ended up, that must have been about three or four three years, or years ago right? now, I'm guessing. Okay. It's, okay. it's uh, and, and, and I was very surprised by those that were promoting this project, their reaction, it was like, wait a minute, you don't, don't shine any light on this. Mm -hmm. don't, we don't welcome scrutiny here. You're just a citizen and we know better than you do. And we're going to, this is gonna happen whether you like it or not. And I was thinking, wait a minute, we gotta have an appropriate solution for the problem you're trying to solve. And what's that problem you're trying to solve? So that whole process of, asking questions and starting to research in our community has led to a, a very visible involvement in the solutions of that and in the debate, in the two-way conversation. And it's led to an area where a role, I had no idea that it would ever lead to where it is now, where now I, I've been elected as a county commissioner mm involved with solving problems at the county level in, in some in degrees. Vancouver, in the Vancouver area. Yes, uh -huh. okay. Yep. And so I love my new job description. Mm -hmm. This company that has uh, grown to be a mature company now is, I don't run it anymore. We still own it outright. It's completely debt-free still. Growing, healthy, prosperous, having a lot of fun solving problems. We export to the world and we're vertically integrated here. We do everything in-house. What are some of those products in the in inventory? Uh, we make you know, inclinometers, sounds like a fancy okay, word, yeah. the word incline, okay. inclinometers. They're actually digital digital level sensors. Mm -hmm. They We become the number one source in the world. We export to all the solar power manufacturers, the, the solar power fields, all those mirrors that move and focus mm. the rays of the sun to okay. generate solar power. Each one of those mirrors needs an a inclination sensor. And so we've become the source for air, all of those, well, I would say all, most of yeah, those throughout right. the world uh, that uh, we, so we provide those sensing that allows those units to be able to focus the rays of the sun to generate okay. solar power. Okay. We also make, uh, des we design and we manufacture and export right from this location in Vancouver, Washington, all the vertical processes that, that uh, we don't farm any of our jobs out. They're all right here. Uh, uh, optical encoders and magnetic encoders. In other words, they're rotary and linear position sensors. So it's a high-tech world. Mm -hmm. And I, it's, it just lends itself to anybody who loves to be an inventor mm -hmm. because it combines multiple fields together, robotics and automation and, and uh, optics and magnetics and PC boards and firmware and software and laser cutting and mm -hmm. clean room operations mm -hmm. and you name it, um, mechanical machining. Uh, electronic discharge machining, mold making, molding, all that stuff. We do that all right here. If anybody wants to come by for a tour, it's a fascinating hmm. tour. Uh, some of our engineers also uh, coach and teach, uh, partner, really mentor in the local high schools. For instance, we have a fellow here, an automation engineer, Roy Thornley. Uh, he has been involved with FIRST Robotics. It's a program, national program, for uh, inspiration and respect for science and technology. Uh, Dean Kamen, the inventor of the Segway and so many of the inventions in America, he's the, like the America's number one inventor, started that first robotics program about 29 years, 20, 29 years ago, and it gets kids bit by the technology bug in high school wow. and in junior high. Wow. In fact, the US Digital, we claim US Digital, it's really Roy Thornley, our engineer, who's actually mentored uh, for the second time, uh, and this just happened just uh, several weeks ago, uh, his team 
uh, is, which is Camas High School, Senator Camas High School here in Clark County, took first place for the state of Oregon and for the state of Washington. And they are going to the nationals uh, in the international competition again this year. Out of, you know, beat Boeing and all these big uh, teams. Wow. And it's just a wonderful inspiration for kids, both gals and guys, to be, get bit by the technology bug so that they can become the technology leaders of America for the future. Because unless you get inspired, you know, what is, what's the meaning of school? Mm -hmm. You need to be able to think, well, there's a practical application for it. So the involvement in our community is something that y you don't realize at first the significance of it. So one of the most wonderful things that can happen to any community is when people who are normally involved in their own circles, of their own relationships, when they step up and they say, you know, we need to serve in a larger arena. We need to serve our community in a sacrificial way to care for our community. And that's really needed right now, mm -hmm. especially in the, in the government uh, Well, you arena. know, I, I'm, I'm hearing your passion, you know what I mean? I'm, oh, yeah, I've got lots of passion. That's very, very much involved with the business, mm -hmm. with, with family, yep. I mean, with community. I mean, most people will, will tend to, yes, okay, fine. I, I'm some, somewhat limited, if you will, in terms of getting involved with community. But here you are. Uh, very successful. I can, I can, I sense it. I also sense the idea of very family-oriented kind of a person. Mm -hmm. yep. Again, community-oriented. Normally, normally business will tend to identify community within a certain radius from the from the business. Got me, and from that particular community. But you've opted to, I mean, to get right into the middle of this thing. I mean, CRC is big. I mean, this is huge stuff. And now all of a sudden, you, 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 county commissioner, if you will, and that's a big job in itself. I mean, David, I mean, how do you do it? it well, well, first of all, it, it is more than a full-time yeah, job, uh, and you, people wonder, how do you run a company you and, do, yeah. and, and do serve as county commissioner? And the answer is, I'm not running a company. Okay. The, the, the process of learning how to delegate and empower other people okay. and trust them with authority, make sure you have the right people that can make competent business decisions, and, uh, put them in charge. And so we have a wonderful team here uh, at U.S. Digital that runs the business better than when I was at the helm. So uh, they are completely uh, autonomous, uh, well, uh, empowered, should I say. I'm still responsible for, yeah, the, yeah. for the major decisions. Yeah. And so I am free to serve more than full time as county commissioner, Wow. Look which it, it, it by itself is a big commitment. I imagine it is. Well, look. We only have a few more minutes, and then I think I'm going to come back and visit with you again on okay. you know, this issue, because there are other issues. But I want to spend a little bit more time on the CRC aspect of it. Sure. One, how did you get involved in it when you first got involved? And as a county commissioner, what brought this thing to the table, and what's your involvement today? Well, the thing that brought it to my attention is it just seemed to be the inappropriateness of the solution, uh, because the quality of life that we have here in Clark County is really, it, it, it's all up in the air right now. Uh, the two bridges that we have connecting Washington to Oregon here mm -hmm. in our area, the I-5 and the I-205, right. those are, are like, the, uh, like these juggler veins here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's our lifeblood right. to that major metropolis right. area. We are not part of Portland. We don't right. want to become part of Portland. Mm -hmm. We respect Portland. But that we're, we're not Portland. Mm -hmm. We have a quality of life that's very different, mm -hmm. and that is really what's being seemed to be. It's it's like we're trying to forfeit mm -hmm. our freight corridor, our economic development along the Columbia River, uh, the health of our community to stand on its own, be, uh, so that we can provide our own jobs here, places of employment on this side of the river. Looks like the those individuals that have been serving in leadership have been elected to office have not been coming from the private industry. Mm -hmm. They've been uh, just simply thinking, what builds government? What, what raises taxes? What, uh, let's charge tolls for those freeways. Let's uh, just do anything that basically uh, kind of exploits mm -hmm. and really oppresses mm -hmm. uh, the people, the productive people in our area. And I'm thinking they got it exactly backwards. We are not to be a parking lot for Portland. We're not to be a bedroom community for Portland. When I drive from East County, across the I-5 every morning, I see that flood of traffic flooding out of our all these wonderful, this workforce here, 
flooding into uh, Oregon to work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that's our that's our Hurricane Katrina. That's you, a disaster every day. You've taken the position that well, actually, uh, Vancouver has taken the position on the light rail. What mm -hmm. was what was the rationale for that? Well, <laughs> light rail is a high density tr tr public transit solution that is appropriate in like inner city Paris, London, maybe inner city even New York, where you've got millions of people in a very tight area where you just can't drive. Uh, uh, so light rail isn't a solution, it is a solution for those areas, but Clark County, mm -hmm. it is totally an inappropriate solution here. And uh, it's like, uh, I love the word practical. Mm -hmm. Practical says you got the right solution, for the job at the right place. Because I'm an infrastructure guy. I love infrastructure. I love to build bridges and build highways and be able to make sure that we got the investment for the future. That infrastructure is our foundation. But light rail will consume everything for our area. It will, t we have two, those two bridges. There's no way we could afford to build a third bridge in the future, certainly not a fourth bridge. And the, <laughs> the light rail is, Basically, it's a it's a 15 mile an hour train from the previous century. Mm -hmm. It is slow. It's the most expensive way, short of a helicopter, that you can get people around. And if you got a whole bunch of you got millions of people you want to move, well, then you got the the dollars per per rider can be divided well enough that well maybe that makes sense. Certainly, it does not for ours. The light rail solution, the reason I'm involved is because that is absolutely a boondoggle. Mm -hmm. It is the wrong fit for uh, moving us forward to the, into this century, the 21st century here. The, uh, you know the definition of insanity? It's okay. doing the same thing over and over <laughs> again and expecting different results. Yes. <laughs> so light rail was promised as the congestion relief solution for the I-84. Mm -hmm. That's in Portland. Mm -hmm. So they, sure enough, they built it along the I-84. They actually boxed the existing transportation corridor in, so now you cannot physically expand the I-84. You cannot add any more lanes there. They took that space away and they used it for light rail. The results, a congestion disaster. Mm -hmm. now, you try driving the I-84 during rush hour and you realize what a disaster that light rail uh, uh, transportation boondoggle has been. And, but they didn't stop there. They made the same promise along the I-5, mm -hmm. just south of the bridge, uh, on the east, on the west side of the I-5, Delta Park area. It's a congestion disaster there, as a result. And they thought, well, let's do the same, make the same promise, and let's go ahead and build it along the I-205. So you come across the I-205 bridge, going into Portland, and you run into stop and go traffic during the rush hour. Because, and you see, uh, they took all that green space that was reserved for widening the I-205 mm -hmm. and ate that with railroad tracks for a 15 mile an hour train for light rail. And it is a congestion disaster. Well, tell me this, on that particular note, the governor of Washington was here not too long ago. Yep. Did he get the message? <laughs> he had a dog and pony show and they had their message all, the, the uh, public relations kind of thing, got that message out. Now's the time to build it or we're going to lose it, uh, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. And I'm thinking, yeah, we should. We could build a pyramid, too. If, it, if we got $1 mm -hmm. from the federal government, we match that with $850 million worth of tolls, and we could build a pyramid, too. It costs a whole lot less to operate, mm -hmm. but it's not the appropriate solution for us. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of do we hurry up and rush with some kind of a, a project where you're going to try to clamor for mm -hmm. money that's going to be debt for generations, paid for by tolls and taxes, or do you end up with a smart solution that will move us, get the most bang for the buck, that will actually be a congestion relief solution like a third bridge? Mm -hmm. So I appreciate his enthusiasm, uh, wrongly directed, wrong solution. He's, uh, uh, he, and what was his response? Did he say anything? Um, well, uh, it, it seems that the promoters, including our, our new governor, mm -hmm. uh, they only know what they've been told. And they've been, mis they've been misinformed. Uh, the promoters of this, the profiteers and the lobbyists that keep saying that this is the right solution for the, you know, you, know, you lose it, use it or lose it, get that money, go after the, the money's the dog food, go after the dog food, you, you gotta get that. Uh, they're misinforming uh, of the authorities. 
They're, it's really not true. For instance, they just published this, the, uh, the CRC bureaucrats just hired a, a couple of high price PR firms and they put together the 64 page document that says facts about light rail, uh, uh, about their, their project. And one of the, on the first page it, it says, it will bring 20,000 direct jobs to, to uh, Vancouver, to Clark County. And that whole fallacy has been debunked. That's just a tiny little thing here. Uh, there was a front page story on the Willamette Week months ago that said, not true times 10, because what they did is they said, well, it might be all, uh, we might even have up to 2,000 workers on that bridge. And, you know, and so that, you multiply that times 10 years of construction, that's 20,000 jobs. And so they said, first fact, bring 20,000 jobs to our area. And, and I'm thinking, what? That math doesn't work. Th th They're th gonna th kill thousands of jobs killed directly right. thousands of jobs along the Columbia right. Business Park. And those Business you Center. know for fact, but yeah. those are specific. What about on the other so, end? So if you do the same math there, yeah. you multiply yeah. 6,000 jobs yeah. lost at right. that one Columbia right. Center, there's four businesses, right. times 10, that's 60,000 jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the math mm -hmm. doesn't work. So mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but in that sort of, so a portfolio, did they identify specifically what jobs, job careers specifically uh, you will not find Washington specifics. Hired. No, of you know course not. Uh, of course <laughs> not. In fact, here's the th the the, uh, the best thing we can do to advance any project mm -hmm. is let's talk about it. Okay, right. Let's have right. a two-way conversation right. and let's it's really go over the specifics. But the the, the uh, it, when it doesn't really hold water, then you really don't want to welcome scrutiny. If you want to promote something and you and you really realize it doesn't stand on its own, mm -hmm. you will not be willing to answer questions. You don't certainly don't want to. And you really don't stand up to scrutiny, and that has been—that's one of the red flags on mm -hmm. anything that says beware, because that's kind of an indicator that something's not right here. The CRC has—we've re paid 170 million dollars mm -hmm. to this bu blank check bureaucracy, no bids. They just giving yeah, the money right. out to that's their right. favorite buddies, and they will not show up to one meeting where they're actually going to be asked questions, and they're not in charge. Well, whose money are we talking about? Well, they're talking about our gas taxes. Right. Our, they're saying we don't have enough to maintain our roads and our bridges or to build anything new. And they're, yep, and, and especially if we're going to build anything of, uh, that's going to be $100 million or more, there's no way we could do that. We can't afford it because we don't have the cash. Well, think about that. They found the cash for $170 million and spent it. We didn't borrow that money. We spent our cash just so far to promote light rail, uh, this boondoggle. And yet, if we're gonna actually build something, they say, oh, you gotta borrow that one. Now, what, a, what, right a, what, what about your other cohorts on the commission? Uh, so we, you, have, you have three, three of them, you have three guys, right? In, 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 yes, there are three county commissioners. Right. Uh, Steve Stewart okay. has been a strong supporter of what I call the, the Columbia River uh, light rail tolling project. Hmm. They like to sell it as a bridge project. It's not a bridge project. We got a bridge. Well, what they do want, want to do is tear down this bridge and, and uh, replace it with a light rail bridge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the, so he's for it. Uh, the uh, other commissioner, uh, Tom Milkey, uh, he thinks like I do. And he basically uh, thinks like the people because we've had a vote on this multiple times. Every time there's a light rail vote, two to one, uh, people in our communities. Say, and that's we what don't you've want done. This. And that's what you've done late. Yes, you voted and on it's this the piece. general election, the same election where I got elected right. okay. in November so of last year. People. We actually had this on the ballot. It mm -hmm. was not an advisory vote. Right. It was right. a binding right. vote okay. that says, "Do you want to pay for this with a with a tax increase for funding operation of maintenance of light rail?" And it went down two to one. And so that is a required by law. It's right. RCW eighty one dot one zero four. So that's about the, really about the congressional delegation. What about the congressional delegation? We just you just picked up a, another congressperson here in the Vancouver. Uh, uh, Jamie Herrera right. uh, Butler. Where, where is she on the position? Um, she is looking to the the community, uh, Clark County, that say if you want this project, then you vote on this project, and if you support it, we'll support it. Well, they've already voted on it. They've said no. Mm -hmm. So where, where, is she? Where, where is she on the, on the project? Uh, well, she is, she's siding with the people. She is not pushing okay. this forward. Okay. She's saying you had a vote and said no. So she's, she's advocating for the people. Now, there's really only a small number of people, of, of actual elected leaders, 
uh, that are supporting this project. You say the governor is kind of like support. Well, that. that's at the state level. That's at the state level. Yeah, okay. But you can't do anything yeah, without yeah, without yeah, the yeah. legislature authorizing right. the funds to right. do so. Right. Really, this comes down to probably about seven or eight, maybe ten people max. Oh, okay. Any uh, names? Can you give me some names? Is, Who are yeah, some sure. of these people? Tim Levitt. From. Uh, um, the Vancouver City Council. There's four okay. people in the Vancouver okay. City Council. Tim they, Levitt was elected. Um, he ran the op uh, he, uh, to oppose tolls for this project. Okay. As soon as he got elected, he, 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 we discovered he is exactly Just the yeah. biggest promoter of tolls in our history. Wow. Okay, so and who so else, like who, to, who else uh, is yeah. sitting up there? Uh, well, there's four uh, city council members okay. in Vancouver and where City are Council. They? Jack, Ber Jack Berkman, uh, Larry Smith, uh, Bart Hansen. Uh, Jeannie Harris, there's actually five there that are supporting this project. Supporting the project. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, they get, to, they get to vote multiple times. They get to vote on, on uh, RTC, uh, CTRAN, uh, their city council, okay, okay. Uh, just this uh, various kinds of boards they sit on, and yet those same individuals, they, they, they oppose to having a vote of the people. So they vote three or four times each while they say no people can't vote at all. Has there ever been a ballot measure on this issue to the people? Yeah, that's what we had in November 2012. And the people, people voted it down. They, uh, yeah, for this is not the first time they voted it down, but that, that was specifically for funding for light rail for this project, people voted it down. We also have in CTRAN, they're the ones that they uh, that put this on the ballot because they had to. That's your transportation piece so. here within the area, right? That's right. Uh, Jim Irish, mayor of, um, uh, <laughs> not the center, um, uh, yes, the center. And we have the small, there's, there's two, uh, three pairs of, of small cities and towns in, in uh, our Clark County. And we, those two pair, those pairs share leadership on CTRAN. Jim Irish, uh, Bill Ganley. And they're all for it. Uh, well, Bill Ganley used to be for it. Mm -hmm. um, and he's actually the chairman of CTRAN now. Mm -hmm. And now he realizes what a mistake it was because he was believing what was being told to them, mm -hmm. like a lot of officials are still being told. Mm -hmm. So he has reversed his position. He is not a supporter of light rail. He is a very strong supporter of a vote for, for light rail and let the people speak. speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he's backpedaled on that and because he's, he said the times have changed. Mm -hmm. Um, originally, they thought the people supported it. It's not true. So uh, the three county commissioners also sit on the CTRAN board. So there's a battle going on there on that board. And only recently have we decided that we're going to record those on uh, CBTV and let people see what's going on there. Because right. we're making decisions that are, that, are ta that are way above our pay grade. No longer are we talking about moving buses around. We're talking about billions of dollars mm -hmm for a, a national project, all resting in the hands of these few little city council people and county commissioners. Well, that's a lot of dollars, you know. When you start talking about $170 million in lobbying fees, you know, that's some, that's some big, big money. Oh, and yeah. Anytime you, you, we need to follow the money and say, who's for exactly, this? Exactly, exactly. The profiteers and the lobbyists and the, the labor unions. Now, I'm a, I'm a pro-union guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want all the jobs that mm -hmm. come with, with, with a major construction project. We just got to make sure it's the right project. Mm -hmm. Now, the unions look at this and they think, oh, you know, all those construction jobs. Yeah, we're for it. Well, yeah, so am I. But yeah, let's get you go, going on the right projects. And the right project is a major project. It's a third bridge. And the most bang for the buck uh, bridge we can actually have is four miles east of the 205, where you connect two existing corridors. You don't have to build a new corridor, just build a bridge. 500 to 700 million dollar bridge, toll free, and the unions can go ahead and have at it. You have all those construction jobs, all for it, but it's got to be the right project. That would be a huge advantage for our area. You look at what the 205 did and how we actually solved this problem mm -hmm. 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. We built the I-205 debt-free, toll-free, wide four lanes each way plus shoulders, no light rail, got good pedestrian going across the middle. You can ride your bike across that, that bridge. Uh, it was 144 feet clearance above the river. They did it all right. And the, we can do that same thing again, four miles east, and we leave the I-205 the I-205 moves 148,000 cars per day, wow. and which is more than the I-5. All of the, both those two corridors are full. Mm -hmm. If you unload the I-205, because I live East County, mm -hmm. so many cars go west, mm -hmm. go across the I-205, mm -hmm. and go east or go a little bit west. And the 
that big U shape that's going on over and over and over, if you put a direct bridge across uh, from 192nd Avenue to Marine Drive, Airport Way, Sandy Boulevard, mm -hmm. and I-84 mm -hmm. there, you will relieve the, the I-205 mm -hmm. so, so mm -hmm. well, which will relieve the I-5, mm -hmm. uh, which would be a wonderful improvement for our whole area. People, they think, oh, you, the, the problem's with the 5. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. zoom out a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's a regional problem, and a solution to a regional problem is a regional solution. The I-205 is meant to be a bypass mm -hmm. for the 5. We right, don't even right. have any, any right. signs there when yeah. people are approaching the, the, that fork in the road. Which yeah. route should I take? Right. If you put a sign up there that said, uh, one of those live electric signs, uh, that would say, go this way, it's going to be an hour and 20 minutes. Go that way, it's 33 minutes. Mm -hmm. Which way do you want to get through mm -hmm. Portland area for? Mm -hmm. People will choose. Mm -hmm. And that, so relieving the I-205 by building another bridge uh, east of it will relieve the 5 mm -hmm. because people are smart. They'll take the, uh, well, the most sensible way. Yes. And yes, you can do it debt-free the same way that we found $170 million mm -hmm. and paid cash for the just the promotion of light rail so right, far. Right, right. Well, you know what, David? Uh, again, like I said, I'm going to revisit. We're going to revisit this issue. But let's say to date, right now, mm -hmm. uh, one, how should the people react? Should they be calling their legislators? Should they be calling their commissioners? Should they be city council people and whatever? One, how should they react? And where are we going from here? Well, one of the key ways uh, that, that one of the key things we need to do is make sure we're in good communication because people divided, uh, they don't do anything. Uh, it's very difficult to get anything done. When you unite and you have good communication, things now we can get something done. So one of the greatest tools we have now is, is social networking. So right. I'm a big so, uh, Facebook uh, guy. I inform right. people and, and, and I have conversations. Mm -hmm. They inform me uh, with a lot of commenting. And so if they, people want to find me, they can go to davidmador.com. That's good. good. And from there, there's a link to my public Facebook. I have both two uh, Facebook accounts. Okay. I have a public Facebook, which okay. is for like county business. Okay. And I have private Facebook, which is our family. I made them both public so they can okay. find out who is this guy? Yeah. Yeah. What is his values? Yeah. What is he like just in his, in mm -hmm. his own life? Does he yeah. have an integrity? Mm -hmm. Does he have values? They can, they can see Well, that. obviously you do. We've done that one. So, uh, <laughs> that's a yeah. good one. That's oh, good it's going one. great. I love yeah. to engage good. with good. people. I love yeah. uh, two-way conversations. So that's just to go ahead and visit my public mm -hmm. Facebook uh, page and see and engage in that conversation. Then you got this outreach piece. Yeah, Coov.com is intended to be a, a voice from the people about our area. So we invite people to come onto this studio here right. and let's talk, have a two-way conversation. We've actually had some of the promoters on this, mm -hmm. on this mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. show here uh, to engage with the community so people can hear both sides. I welcome openness, transparency, uh, yeah, just accountability to a conversation, let the sun shine, things happen good. But just to answer your question, where yeah. to from here, okay. um, one is one of the last posts I made in my, on my Facebook was to contact these, there are six key phone numbers, uh, senators that are on the Transportation Committee okay. within their state legislature, and I put their names and their numbers on my Facebook, call them and let them know uh, about your position on this project. And uh, the, they want to hear. Uh, a key thing, I, I just got off the phone a little bit earlier today uh, with the co-chair, uh, Senator Curtis King, who is charged with this, with this decision for the transportation budget for Washington State. And he has invited and welcomed us to have a countywide vote on this issue this primary, August 6th. And they want to know, do the people buy into this or not? And so this would put to rest any of those claims that say, well, um, <laughs> the people really support it, but we, we really, you know, mm -hmm. but we just do a special poll or something. Well, if they really believe that people support it, they will support a countywide vote. So if the countywide, and I can tell you as county commissioner, and we already have green light from the uh, at least one other commissioner, and I think two. Uh, and we also have the authorization that says, yeah, we can do this from our own prosecuting attorney, uh, that yes, we can, and yes, we will have a countywide vote on this project this August 6th. And the state legislature is asking us to for that feedback. They want to know, do the people, are they supporting this project, or they want us to stop this project? and let the evidence speak for itself. It becomes self-evident 
And those people that claim that they support it, well, good. Let the voters decide. The ballot box, only this time, yes will mean yes, and no will mean no. Mm -hmm. You think that's going to happen? I can guarantee you it's going to happen. <laughs> yes, it will happen. People will have a chance to vote, even though up to this point they say, no, it's out of our hands, it's, un it's not our jurisdiction. And uh, so what that's really saying is we don't really want the people to, we don't want to hear from the people. Have you had the opportunity to interview with the Colombian or the Oregonian uh, on this issue? Uh, on the Colombian, I've had a multiple interviews with them. And I'll, I'll interview with anybody. It does to me. There's no such did, thing as an unfriendly. How, what audience. was the outcome on that piece? Did they support you? And uh, what position have the, have the Colombian taken on well, this? Well, the issue? Colombian has uh, actually the, the owner of the Colombian is actually sits on the board of Identity Clark County as a director of the uh, of this of <laughs> Identity Clark County, which is David Evans and Associates, which is all the profiteers. Uh, so basically, they've taken a, a very committed position. If you're going to be a director. Wow. On a board of director member on any organization, you pledge to support the goals of that organization. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that organization is the good old boy network of the profiteers involved in mm -hmm. this. So, of course, they're supporting this project. They're doing whatever they can to call this a bridge project. That And they run all their stories about how the, uh, the people are... They, they, they actually they have a John Laird. They actually name call very disrespectful to the people who stand for a third bridge or people mm -hmm. who oppose this mm -hmm. project. They call them hounds of Winerville and cockroaches and just terrible You mean this particular disrespect. board? Uh, well, the, the, uh, group, so the, the, the editorial, editorial board, board I got you. of yeah. the Columbian. Okay. It's, it's, uh, so we really, we don't, we really shouldn't make this personal. We wouldn't, should not be yeah. disrespectful. We need, if we, if we, if there's plus and minus arguments, advantages and disadvantages, you know, the, the tug of war between should we do this or should, shouldn't we do it. We need to really go about it in a way that's courteous, respectful, honorable, uh, objective. You, we, we don't go into name calling or, dis, or just making people demonize them right, right, or right. that kind of thing. It really needs to be on the merits of the project not on attacking right, the individual. Right. You know, another position. point I want to bring out uh, that I'd like to share, get the response from you in regards to Tiffany Couch. It's my understanding her at one point. Mm -hmm. I, I've had her on my show a couple of times, and I thought it was very enlightening. I mean, it was just some powerful stuff mm -hmm. up there on that piece. Want to say a couple of comments about yes, some of the uh, results? Yes, yeah, so I, I look at Tiffany's Couch, t uh, her office, uh, Tiffany Couch has the an office in the uh, uh, what do you call it? Officers Row okay. in the Fort Vancouver area. Yeah, that yeah. is a national treasure. Yes, yes, it is. And I consider Tiffany Couch to be a national Thank treasure you. right here is. in her oh, own backyard. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> uh, people, uh, some people don't know her credentials and who she really is. And, uh, but let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh, her integrity is incredible. Uh, she is a national instructor for fraud examiners. She teaches fraud examination. Hmm. Uh, she is a, a certified, uh, uh, what do you call it, forensic, forensic yeah. accountant. Mm -hmm. right. Those, uh, all the letters oh, yeah, behind yeah. a person's oh, yeah. uh, name, this is way above a CPA. Yes. And she is in great demand across the United States. And she gets the privilege, and she loves doing what she's doing, because when, when businesses or when governments of any level get in trouble, they call her and she goes in and she discovers what really happened and she presents uh, the story and the problem gets solved. She's kind of like a Sherlock Holmes yeah, in the accounting yeah, world. Yeah, yeah. And she Thanks. is highly respected. Yes. I've seen people challenge her and to kind of demean her and that kind of thing and she will wrestle them to the ground because yeah, yeah. that you don't mess with Tiffany Couch. What the, the thing that gives her, uh, really the, the foundation for her integrity is her allegiance to truth. Turn on the lights and she's not gonna tell you what to do with it yeah, except yeah. if, it's, if, well, if it, it needs to be investigated, she'll recommend that you go out and investigate that. But she has turned on the lights and she has been a truth teller and one of the smartest things that a forensic accountant can do and what she has done is she'll go into the documents of those that are uh, providing, in mm -hmm. this case, the uh, CRC uh, bureaucracy, uh, and use their own records to tell the truth. And one of those, for instance, <laughs> the, 
just it seems this is almost like a movie this would make a great movie when it's all said and done mm -hmm. because of the shenanigans and really the the i mean I, I i like to define terms so i use terms very carefully uh like fraud waste corruption scandal um uh, those words you got to be really careful about which would but, you which would you which would you decide um, well, on these, yes. they all, in my, as I all, understand all what inclusive. those are, in the layman's terms, mm -hmm. all of that's happening mm -hmm. okay. right here, mm -hmm. right before our eyes. And when that, and that will come out with time, and it is... It, and Tiff it, Tiffany it, goes along with that? So well, just to give facts. you a little bit of the, just one little sample here. Okay. Uh, she's been desired, she's asked for the, the detailed budget, that you have to have a detailed budget right. for this, mm -hmm. this project. Mm -hmm. And they, for, I, it was many, many months, and I think it was going on a year, that they said, oh, it doesn't exist. And as uh, public information request, right. the state law says you gotta provide it. And they didn't provide it. A violation of state law, by the way, when they don't provide it, you're supposed to answer within five days and provide it within 30 days. And uh, finally, she, in her investigation, she found reference to the detailed budget, but they called it a different name. And so she asked for it by that name and they had to give it to her. So they, so they gave it to her and she said, sure enough, this, this is a detailed budget. They just disguised what it was by calling it some funny name. So she went through that detailed budget and it was very detailed. It shows where every dollar is going. And what she discovered is that what they were telling the public was a very different story than what their own detailed budget says. <laughs> so for instance, there's a bunch of Oregon or there's a number of Oregon interchanges and there's a bridge, and there's Washington interchanges, and there's light rail components. Well, their detailed budget reveals that they have cost shifted around $400 million of the cost of Oregon interchanges and say, well, they're really $400 million less. And then the cost of the bridge, which is funded by tolls, mainly by the commuters of Clark mm -hmm. County, that the cost of the bridge is really $400 million more than it really is. $400 million, well, it was out of 40 or 50%. Uh, price fudge. The result of that, it, well, first of all, it's it's misrepresentation of the truth. You could use other right, terms right. like fraud uh, on the taxpayers, but the, their own numbers show, uh, show that, and yet they're still publishing that. Now she went up to the state legislature and she testified in front of the committee there. Jim Moeller, uh, state representative the from the 49th district, Washington, Washington uh, was there. And uh, she, she testified and she revealed that one little fact along with many others. And the other senators and assemblymen looked at him and, and said, do you realize what she just said? You got any questions? You want to refute that? No. <laughs> and I looked at him and thought, what? She's telling the truth? Well, the silence said, yeah, it was. You know, the truth is there because it's, it's their own documents. But the problem is, that when they find out, they just disregard it, and they somehow go after the credibility of the person sharing the truth, which is, how, how right is that? Yeah. We should welcome scrutiny, we should right. welcome the right. truth. Right. Uh, the numbers don't add up on this project, mm -hmm. and it should be able to sell itself. Just tell us, if you want to sell us a mega project, and there are appropriate times to invest in a, in a mega project. But you got to be truthful about it, yes. and you can't compromise integrity, and you never violate the the, the, the ballot box. You never violate our, our the integrity of our of our government or the trust of people. Okay. And we've done all those things okay. in this project. Well, David, I tell you, we, we, we're going to have to have chapter two for sure. Okay, on this particular issue, we want to thank you very much. I mean, I'm telling you, the people out here are going to be welcoming this this interview because, in all due respect, they don't know. The average layperson don't know. No, they just pay the taxes, if uh, you will. One thing really good about this is that uh, apathy and non-involvement, they're founded on not knowing. Yes. But when people, especially American people, we're very independent people. We do not like our rights to be violated. Exactly. When they discover what's happening on this project, they will be outraged to the point where at least they'll participate and they'll say, none of that business, not on my watch, you're not going to do that to me, and they'll get involved, and that's one of the advantages of this. Yeah. David, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, folks, there you go. You've heard it from David Medora. David Medora, businessman, family folks, family man, community person, outreach, I mean, gee whiz, on and on and on.
again, we're going to have chapter two on this particular issue. Mm -hmm. And we want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to be before you, tell your neighbors, I mean, email this particular show to anyone else. It's on YouTube. Uh, it's on both entities and that uh, the other. And so, again, thank you very much. I'll be talking to you again. And as George Page, a good friend of mine, used to say from Channel 2, back to what you believe in. Have a good one.